Video games are now a mainstream component of the entertainment industry at large. A fact repeated so often that it's almost become a cliche. To put things into perspective, a new report estimates that the full value of the gaming industry now exceeds $300 billion, which is more than the markets for both movies and music combined. To everyone present here, welcome to Lecture Series Tech Niche 2021. Through Lecture Series, our goal has always been to facilitate interaction with remarkable innovators of various fields. It's an absolute honor to welcome today's guest, Professor Christopher Weaver, who's the founder of Bethesda Softworks and now distinguished professor of computational media at Wesleyan University. Bethesda Game Studios is the award-winning development team known around the world for their groundbreaking work on the Elder Scrolls and Fallout series. The most important, impactful, tsunami-like changes in, to our culture and society always come from those things that we least expect to have that impact. The appeal of games is universal, and there are powerful dynamics that govern behavior within them. How can we broaden our thinking about harnessing the subliminal power of games while applying them to other areas of endeavor? Before we find out the answers to these exciting questions, I'd like to remind the audience that we have a Discord server where you can watch and discuss this lecture with friends and fellow enthusiasts. We'll also be running a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, you can drop them below. With that, let's head right on to the event and extend a warm welcome to Professor Weaver. Over to you, sir. Thank you, good morning. I'm gonna take you on a wild ride this morning or this evening. Um, we're on the verge of exascale computing. I don't know how many of you are computer scientists, but the potential of having computers that are almost as intelligent as uh, human beings from the standpoint of brain capacity, computational capacity, really appreciate right now. So what I want to do is I want to try and give you a sense of where think about video games as games. Uh, to see that the implications of how games work and how human beings' brains work are remarkably intertwined. And if we can understand some of the underlying factors, we have a much better way of applying this kind of technology into the future. And then think about not so much games. I want you to think about how a different kind of discussion, but it's interrelated. So let me give you a smattering of some of the research and some of the things that are implied, and then I'll be happy to take some of your questions afterwards. In his 2006 epic, The Singularity is Near, Ray Kurzweil forecast that as technology accelerates, there'll be a phase transition where humankind would become transhuman and then posthuman. His thesis forecasts the ways that this transition might occur and its effects upon society. When we look at various advances and overlaps in areas of neuroscience and artificial intelligence and communications and computation and nanotechnology and biosynthetics, we begin to see remarkable and impending phase shifts on the horizon. But this is a picture of the Tian Er. It's a 33.86 petaflop. That's a petaflop being 10 to the 15. Guangzhou, China. One petaflop, as some of you may know, is equal to one quadrillion floating point operations a second. It's heard every word spoken by every human being on the planet from the beginning of supercomputer, 29. Hello, sir. I'm sorry for interrupting. Was crowned the world's fastest supercomputer. Sir, can you hear me? 
Yes. I'm sorry for interrupting, but it seems to me that your audio and video has been lagging. I think there's a connection issue from your side. Hold on, let me see if I can improve it. I'd like to tell the audience that we're sorry for the inconvenience. It seems like Sarah's has lost connection. Please stay with us while we try to fix it. I mean, do you want me to call back in? Sure, you could try logging back in. I'm gonna try and log in again. For some reason, I don't know why it's lagging. Uh, I'll call right back. Yes, yeah, sure, sir. Meanwhile, we'll be playing a short promo while he returns. Nanya, can you hear me better now? We can hear you, but it seems like when you're presenting, it keeps uh, going away for a bit. You could try presenting again. Okay, stand by.
All right, tell me if this is any better. I'm sorry for the connection. Not much no problem, sir. It seems to be better now. Okay. Stand by one. All right. Um, we were at the we were at the summit uh, computer, which is located in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now, summit has two point four one million cores, and it's capable of one four eight point six petaflops, with a two hundred petaflop peak. It uh, up until very recently was the world's supercomputer. Now, Kurzweil, the fellow that I spoke about in terms of the book Singularity, he wrote that the human brain is equivalent to an exaflop computer, one exaflop being equivalent to 1,000 petaflops, so it's 1 times 10 to the 18th. To match what a one exaflop computer system can do in one second, you would have to perform one calculation per second for 31,688,765,000 years. Now, Kurzweil believed that it would be possible to achieve exascale performance by 2027. Computer scientists now believe that exaflop speed can be achieved sometime later this year, six years earlier than Kurzweil's predictions of almost 20 years ago. That means that a computer as powerful as the human brain will likely be created within the next year or two. We're not talking about quantum computers at the moment for a number of reasons we can discuss if you want afterwards. But the important thing is I want you to think of the implications of what this means when we have that kind of computational horsepower. Because in parallel with the neuroscience behind the way that games work, the increasing cap capability of computers and high-speed networks and augmented reality and computational media the ability to mimic perceived reality becomes ever more convergent with reality. The space race has absolutely nothing on the land race. And despite the fact that many people believe that the male brain is best exemplified by Homer Simpson, the truth is that there is a lot more similarity in all our brains than most people realize. Let me give you some useful examples. The human brain operates at exascale performance. So we're about a hundredth of the way to being able to simulate the computational horsepower of a human brain. For proof of brain similarity, we need to look at a few of the evolutionary aspects of the human brain. For example, let's talk about something such as a simple smile. Smiles really aren't all that simple. We know when we start an interaction, we evidence a resting smile, which is neutral. It's non-committal. A smiling animal was generally considered non-threatening, allowing the animal to socialize and play with the pack. This behavior also forms a part of primal learning. The closest human mannerism of this early animal behavior is this polite smile that we show in unknown or uncomfortable situations. Now, so this is a mannerism that's existed in animals before language. And as our brains evolved, more complex facial mannerisms developed as a way to mimic this non-threatening behavior. And it lessened the potential for conflict within a group. Now, that mechanism involves further lip curl and upper quadrant squinting, and it is called a Duchenne smile. Now we know this to be true from an evolutionary standpoint as we're all familiar with it in humans and in other primates. But even more important, it is that this built-in behavior is also seen in babies as young as six to eight weeks. So we can see that smiling is part of an evolutionary signaling mechanism that's evolved for social purpose. Why is this important? Because hardwired responses influence the way that we learn and the way we react to the outside world. What we term free will is often just blissful ignorance of our genetically programmed brains. 
Now, like smiling, visual illusions are hardwired. In reality, your perception of an illusion has more to do with how your brain processes visual information than with your eyes themselves. After all, let's remember that our eyes have simple convex lenses, right? So if we follow classic physics and classic optics, which forms an inverted image on our retina. So all of us are sitting on the ceiling right now. It is our brains that are dynamically rotating the images sent by our optical nerves 180 degrees. Nevertheless, while very important to sighted people, our eyes are only one of the input devices that our brains use to interpret the world. Pay attention and listen closely. Ba, 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 so what just happened? You believe that you heard somebody say, fa, ba, ba, fa, fa, fa. Makes perfect sense. The only problem is, is that the person never said fa. The person said ba. You interpreted it because even as our ears transmit analog waveforms through our auditory nerves, our eyes transmit visual information, which includes facial and phonetic gestures. The brain uses articulatory phonetics to interpret speech. In this case, you literally heard what you saw, even though it wasn't true. So it would seem to be easy to separate what we hear from what we see, but that's just not the case. Our reality is what our brain allows us to perceive as reality. Immersive presence is the condition that allows our brains to accept as real that which we intellectually know is not. When you experience AR or VR that fills your vision, a portion of your brain perceives it as real. You duck under a low hanging girder. If you're being pushed off a precipice that you see visually, even though you may remember that you came into a flat room before you put on these VR glasses, your heart still starts racing as adrenaline floods your body in a fight or flight response. Perceived presence is the ultimate suspension of disbelief. Now humans are evolutionary infravores. In fact, our neural mechanisms are designed to reward us for information collection. When we collect and utilize information that helps us succeed or perceive that we succeed, Endorphin molecules bind to the opiate receptors on brain cells, creating pleasure. The density of these receptors varies along our ventral visual pathway, which recognizes objects and scenes. The densest area is in something called the parahippocampal cortex. Now this is where visual information engages memory. The richer the scene in new and novel information, the greater the pleasure and humans love pleasure. Over and above the experience itself, the way that we recognize pleasure and continue to seek it out is through neural programming or conditioning. In general, we seek to enhance things that we like and we distance ourselves from things that we do not. I want to show you a very interesting and until recently completely impossible thing for you to see. I'm going to show you an optical quantum imaging video. Now, Professor Troy Littleton's team of MIT Brain and Cognitive Sciences Lab found that the protein synaptogamin 7, SYT7, which is found in humans and other mammals, allows circuits to increase or decrease their strength through altering amounts of the release of this SYT protein just like the volume dial on an amplifier. Now, what you're watching is based on recent advances in optical quantum 
imaging that allows us to see the actual neurotransmission of a neuromuscular junction by tethering a fluorescent calcium sensor to the postsynaptic membrane. Now, this is of a fruit fly, but human neurons work the same way. So we're now able to better understand how the brain programs neural circuit pathways electrochemically as we begin, begin to peer into the mind of nature herself. So as much as we like to think of ourselves as unique, we're all electrochemical biogenetic organisms in a constant state of heuristic alteration. In their book, The Playful Brain, Venturing to the Limits of Neuroscience, Sergio and Vivian Pellis bring forth a deep analysis of the underlying mechanisms that influence animal behavior and the latest science behind how behaviors affect vertebrates. I want to tell you some of their important findings. Play occupies 20% of an animal's daily time and up to 10% of their daily energy budget. As play means there's less time to feed. So it must have, play must have compensatory benefits. Otherwise, nature would have eliminated play long ago because it would never allocate that amount of time to not feeding itself unless there was some mechanism that was compensatory. So we now know that play fighting during the juvenile period produces specific neurochemical changes and leads to the production and release of growth factors that alter the anatomy of cells in the prefrontal cortex. The brain not only shapes play, but play shapes the brain. Play, play fine-tunes coping mechanisms to deal with unpredictable events. We call this emotional calibration. And this emotional calibration improves social skills as well as self-protective abilities. This is a critically important area that most people don't understand. Of all animals, human beings have the largest brains and are the most playful species relative to body size. At the University of Washington, biologists found that play changes gene expression in children. So play really does shape our brains. In fact, play is a critical component of who we are as socially adept human beings. At its neurophysiologic core, what is play but associative memories composed of what is pleasurable and what is not? A recent article in the journal Neuron established that unfamiliar contextual associations created new memories by repatterning individual neurons within 300 to 500 milliseconds, forming episodic memory formation. Now, episodic memory is the ability to consciously recall experiences and events and solutions, and it relies on rapid and effortless formation of new associations. In other words, a large proportion of the MTL, the media temporal lobe, these neurons expand their selectivity to encode specific associations after just a few trials. I mean, we're basically walking movie cameras. Our brains repattern associative memory events basically as fast as we can intellect a new scene and its associations. Now, how do we know this is true? Among other things, people who have a condition called hyperthalmesia have the ability to recall a specific day's events right down to what the weather was, what was on the television or the news or on the newspaper. We do not forget these events. Those of us who don't have hyperthalmesia simply lack the, the search mechanisms to find the events but the events are nevertheless locked in your brain. So perceiving subtle movement along with echolocation was one of the earliest keys to human survival. That's why it's there. But the more interesting question is how we're applying that knowledge today. Early picture flipbooks and zoetropes took advantage of this episodic pattern recognition to create moving images. 
So this is the primary way that we came to understand the relationship between speed of image and visual persistence. In 1986, when the Lumiere brothers first showed their silent film, La Reve du Trente en Guerre de la Ciertat, it was on a white sheet pinned to the wall of a darkened room. Now, even though the audiences knew that they were witnessing a projected visual image on the solid wall, they, they knew this intellectually, people are reported to have still jumped out of the way, jumped out of their seats to avoid getting crushed by the oncoming train. Now, eventually society was willing to overcome their fears of this new technology and trade for the perceived entertainment benefit. Let me see if I can show you an actual image from that. Too bad. Um, I, I used to have an image that worked here where you could actually see the train moving. But the important point is, is that society was willing to overcome their fears of this new technology in trade for the perceived benefit. And the same thing has happened with the telegraph and the telephone and radio and television. And today with the internet, computer games and simulation. Now, just as young computer game playing NASA scientists advanced government computer operating systems during their off hours so their games could work better, true story. So has the games industry pushed graphics and computer manufacturers to improve their products dramatically over the past 40 years. Were it not largely for the games industry, Sophisticated graphics technology and processor intensive computers would still cost millions and be located in large rooms with special air conditioning systems. Now, most of you don't remember that. Some of us who are a little older than you are do. The games industry had the economic force to pull an optimization war among microprocessor and graphic manufacturers. Were it not for game hardware, there would be no trickle down to many other areas of application that you use every day. The iPhone, for example, is computationally more powerful than the computer power of the Apollo spacecraft. This is when the United States sent two astronauts to the moon. Two generations of computer game players are now grown and they have their own children. These children have grown up with games and they accept that games can be used for entertainment. You're those children. You also understand, because of your level of sophistication of using this kind of hardware, that while games are primarily used for entertainment, they can be repurposed for other uses. And this follows the natural cycle of disruptive technology application. And it's only gonna to serve to broaden the impact of game technology on society. Current game consoles, are 64 times as powerful as their first incarnations. That they have the computer computing power of military supercomputers of less than 20 years ago. And if Moore's law holds true, 25 years hence, a single game console will be computationally equivalent to 10,000 human beings. Now that time frame puts Kurzweil's singularity firmly within the window of his estimate. We're entering a, a new, a completely new era of immersive computation unknown to any humans before us. And just as the telephone changed the concept of communication and the internet changed socializing and commerce, augmented and virtual reality promised to change the way that we perceive reality itself. We've already established in this lecture that the brain hears what it sees. So what about conversations over the phone where vision is not involved? When you call someone on the telephone, you believe you're speaking directly to them. Well, that may have been true a century ago when dedicated analog circuits were created between parties. But today, you are actually participating in a turn-based exchange 
over a Poisson distributed, distributed network with a quantized and queued reconstruction of a frequency modulated data stream, Dow converted to analog within a 3K parametric window because humans discern voices best within that frequency range. And you thought you were having a conversation with someone else. The truth is that telephone technology is just good enough so that your brain accepts the simulated reproduction of the analog waveforms from the other end. Human beings are usually the weakest link in every technology chain. And engineers take flagrant advantage of that fact because to a computer, human beings take forever to process information. Now imagine that the reality that you've long accepted over the telephone is the reality that you'll come to accept in the visual world. Now that's exactly where games and simulation are taking us toward immersive real-time experiences. We're not quite there yet for some neurobiological reasons, but we're slowly narrowing the gap and recent technology improvements are helping dramatically. Computational speed is one of them. And as I told you before, exascale computers will solve many of the problems. So let's take a little leap here for a minute. In classrooms of tomorrow, we make educational spaces that are well-lit and modern. We install telepresence equipment. Classrooms are open. They have large display walls, comfortable surroundings. The only problem is that as nice as the surroundings may be, the mechanisms employed to teach are virtually the same as they were a century ago. And the manner in which we teach complex subjects, such as science, is still largely by rote. That's because we forget that learning facts is not the same as solving problems. If you just accumulate facts, you forget them because you don't neurochemically embed that information because as I showed you before in the, in the journal Neuron, there's no associative context because that's the way that we as human beings are wired. We need associative context to be able to chemically embed this kind of information and then have recall. From a scientific perspective, games are actually simulated problem spaces. Now look at what's on your screen. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Simulated problem spaces. How many of you have played a game, been middling at it when you started? And if you really enjoyed or liked the game, by the time you were through, you, you verged on mastery, on being an expert. That's because in games, players solve problems through system reasoning and system thinking. System thinking is how variables interact in complex ways with each other. If we're going to solve complex problems, students need to understand how complex systems work. Games are their own complex system with rules that interact and trigger events based upon decisions. Games teach model-based reasoning, where one first tries to understand the larger model in order to better understand the goals and the reasoning behind optimizing, optimizing their actions to best achieve the desired goals while allowing for the possibility of emergent actions. So we'll call this reasoning adaptive or creative. System thinking and model-based reasoning are exactly what we need to implement in our schools. The next generation intelligent courseware will be able to modulate lessons according to individual student abilities. Such customized learning will allow students of every age and ability to develop core competencies in areas that are important to every child growing up in the 21st century. These pictures that you're seeing are of my students who have actually created games that teach science, STEM science games, to young children. Now, these children are supposed to be problem children, you know, and we picked the school for this reason. 
And I want you to look at these children and look at their faces. And you tell me, as these children play these games and learn science, whether or not they're anything but immersed in what they're doing. Because once system thinking and model-based reasoning are understood, generative solutions can be cross-applied to many other situations. Games are about sequencing and logic. They work as an intellectual scaffold of increasing difficulty, challenge, and complexity. All the time while providing real-time feedback along the way. As I said, look at these children's faces. We need to expand such deep learning mechanisms to all schools and educational institutions where children are allowed to be naturally curious and to explore and to test safely while learning at their own pace. If games teach us anything, it's that humans enjoy challenge. Getting a trophy for showing up is ultimately destructive to a child's self-image. This Panglossian worldview leads to a false sense of self-worth, yet it's the latest new math of child rearing. In reality, humans want to be pleasantly frustrated. Learning occurs when there is a challenge, but you're confident that you can overcome that challenge with effort. Now, by keeping the, the problem right at the edge of what we call your regime of competence, the challenge produces deep concentration and focus. Now, this connected engagement is one of the key underpinnings in Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi's seminal work, Flow, which is all about optimized experience. Csikszentmihalyi found, among many other things, that there were two groups of people most adept at achieving flow in the shortest amount of time. The first were Tibetan monks through lifelong meditation. The other group was, wait for it, serious gamers. Now, why is this? Tibetan monks and serious gamers. To optimize learning, one needs to develop contextual focus. The cycle of expertise also includes and incorporates mental scaffolding. You present a challenging problem within your range of capacity. You practice to achieve mastery of that challenge. You provide a slightly more complex challenge. You apply creative solutions to re-achieve a sense of mastery and repeat. This is the way humans become expert. And this is precisely the way games work. The noted behavioral linguist and sociologist, Jim G, has observed and demonstrated that the benefits of playing video games are, among many other things, improved cognition and judgment, listening and carefully following directions, problem solving, multitasking and teamwork, learning strategies and management of resources, pattern recognition, spatial reasoning, quantitative calculation and controlling emotions while maintaining focus. Now let's talk about another avenue of game application, that of augmented and virtual reality. 40 plus years of AR experiments in specialized laboratories, funded by those who could afford the high cost of that equipment. Now this is finally entering the realm of public affordability. And with that affordability comes an explosion of interest and experimentation. Now, more than any other industry, the military has known and funded much of the industry's early VR and AR development. The anecdotal evidence is overwhelming. Today's applicants have rapid problem solving skills and the best hand-eye hand -eye coordination of any candidates in the history of the military. The transition to pilotless vehicles is virtually seamless. 
And there's, it's no accident that controllers for UAVs are virtually identical to game controllers, thereby taking advantage of learned behaviors. Vehicle simulators provide situational awareness and emergency training. And every operator would be far better at what they were doing if they were familiar, not just with how to operate their vehicle within the standard flight envelope, but at the hairy edges of it. And in the visualization of complex technical material, there can be little doubt that visualization of atomic structures and virtual devices in three dimensions shared over the internet will have a material benefit on collaboration across distance. The current pandemic has only served to underscore the need for collaborative digital communications in every aspect of our lives. So let's talk about one or two other applications, psychology. VRET, VR exposure therapy is a very promising anti-anxiety treatment and pain management therapy that's rooted in games that allows patients to confront anxiety triggering events while immersed in a realistic but controlled 3D environment. Now, as you can see from this picture, the woman who is screen right clearly has arachnophobia, which is very common, a fear of spiders. What happens is, if you look carefully at the left hand of the man facing the woman, you will see that the man has a model in his hand of a spider. And one of the legs of the model is touching the hand of the woman. What the woman is seeing is she is seeing a tarantula in front of her in free space. But the tarantula can be varied in terms of its transparency. This is a very important point. For those people who have severe and violent phobias, such as arachnophobia, the brain causes many events to occur right up to something called vasovagal response, which can make you faint. But the brain is also highly intelligent because as we, we, we spoke about before, we're all upside down right now. The spider is created translucently for the patient. In other words, the patient can see through the spider. By seeing through the spider, the brain that has the phobia feels the touch of the spider on the finger, sort of the hand, but is looking through the spider, which is not the way the phobia is supposed to work. The phobia depends upon a belief that the spider is real. The brain looks through this spider hovering in there. And because the brain can see through the spider, the brain knows something's wrong. And by varying the translucency, the transparency of the spider over time, the human being who has the phobia is able to become more and more exposed to a less and less transparent image because the brain retrains itself to understand that the image is not real. And by the time the image is perceived as real, the brain's phobia mechanism has been interfered with. Now, this is an extremely powerful tool in the hands of behavioral psychologists. And it works equally well with arachnophobia as it does with things like fear of flying and heights. The ability to modulate exposure and intensity of experience is a major factor in the success of this therapeutic approach. And a growing body of research supports the technique as being longstanding. So VRET has been shown to be more effective than any prior traditional forms of exposure therapy.
such as mental visualization of photographs. And it has a, a lasting effect. So the therapy holds great promise in many other areas as well, such as pain management, because people who are engrossed, for instance, in games, have much higher pain thresholds than people who are not. At Johns Hopkins Hospital in Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland, Professor of Neuroscience and Stroke Rehabilitation Specialist, Dr. John Krakow, uses games to help victims with stroke paralysis retrain their bodies to compensate for the neurologic damage to their brains. Most of you probably know that when someone has a severe stroke, because of the way that the brain is wired, one half of the body is affected on some level, the other half is not. Force feedback devices coupled with immersive game environments. Look in the background and you will see that's actually Dr. Krakauer there in the force feedback device. But if you look carefully, what you'll see in front of you is a fish, specifically a porpoise. Now let me tell you why this is important. John Krakauer is using these force feedback devices coupled with immersive game environments for patients to use proprioception and fine motor adaptation to rebuild new neural pathways and regain control of their damaged limbs. Now, while none of these things is an exact science, in modern medicine, the typical way that people who've had severe stroke paralysis are dealt with is you allow the patient, you know, a few weeks to heal. And then after the healing process, you go to physical therapy once or twice a week for a number of weeks, generally, at least in the United States, as long as insurance will pay for you to have this therapy. The bottom line is, is that from a statistical standpoint, about 80% of the patients who have severe strokes end up having residual effects. That means that they never regain pre-stroke abilities, not, not completely. John Krakauer's method, Dr. Krakauer's method has resulted in a motor cognition process that promises to change this stroke rehabilitation forever. His numbers are phenomenal, and let me tell you why. In that force feedback device, which in this case is on the appendage that has to do with the arm, but it can work for the, the leg just as easily. He is using his eyes to be the por to be the porpoise. He's the, the avatar is the porpoise. Porpoises, as you probably know, need to breathe air, which means they need to go to the surface of the water but they eat under the water. So what does this mean? It means that you put someone in one of these machines the next day after they've had a severe stroke. You literally will tie them into the chair and tie them into the force feedback device. And you tell them, you're now this fish, you're now this porpoise. You have to move around. And if you can't get to the surface, you're gonna die because you have to breathe. And oh, by the way, don't forget you have to eat. So what happens is, is people who are trying to be the porpoise, if you look carefully at that force feedback device, what do you need to do if you're a porpoise? You need to do this, right? You need to make your tail go back and forth in order to go forward. And if you wanna go up to the surface, you need this movement. This is a multi-articulated joint. To do these kinds of movements is extremely complicated. This is why robots don't have those sorts of beautiful movements with articulated joints. It's a choreography of phenomenally subtle neural pathway mapping. And by forcing the patients to remap their brains, to be the fish, to be the porpoise, John Krakauer's numbers are remarkable. He has over a 90% success rate with patients regaining full use of their limbs. 
it promises to change the way that stroke rehabilitation is done forever. And what is he doing it with? Repurposed video games. As modern medicine, let's talk about seniors for a minute. As modern medicine helps facilitate the largest number of elders in the history of the planet, maintaining plasticity in the largest aging population in history will be an important component in future societies. People are going to live much longer in the future and computer assisted education will play an important part in maintaining cognitive and motor skills. And in medicine, the system which is called magic mirror system for anatomy education developed at the University of Munich to teach grow, grow, uh, gross anatomy is capable of showing you the inside of your body by basically superimposing CAT scans and using a Microsoft Connect to know exactly where you are looking or your hands are in terms of what you want to see in the body. The system uses Microsoft Connect game controllers to provide in situ positional feedback with a custom database of MRI and radiographs mapped into the viewer's body or onto the viewer's body. And in the United States, Microsoft partnered with Case Western Reserve University to use their commercial, easily purchasable, HoloLens system in medical training. A small German medical imaging company called Anima Res applied the exact same technology to create Insight Heart, a commercial medical training program where prospective cardiologists have the ability to manipulate the heart in dimensions that were never previously achievable if you were doing gross anatomy dissection. Insight Lungs, by the way, is in the works. Now, beyond anatomy training, augmented reality is advancing surgery by allowing physicians to enhance anatomical features. And with vascular overlay, all graphically produced, they can better visualize a patient's anatomy. Simulation software even allows surgeons to practice the upcoming procedure on a virtual patient, a phantom patient. After practicing on the virtual patient that has the exact same anatomy as the patient upon whom they're going to operate, the surgeon can then perform the surgery on the actual patient with the added benefit of knowing that patient's specific anatomy to minimize operative risks. These graphics assist the surgeon during the operation by superimposing anatomical structures, such as a hidden organ or an artery, which the surgeon must locate or avoid. A computer tracks the robotic arms. Now this is a da Vinci machine that you're looking at. This is something used all over the developed world. A computer tracks these robotic arms, as well as the movement of the patient's organs in real time. It tracks the deformation and it executes or corrects for accuracy while calculating optimal surgical trajectory for entry and exit points for dissection and suture and cautery and related surgical procedures. I want to show you an example. If you're squeamish, close your eyes and just listen. Listen carefully. Uh, this, is a, this is a French video and, and uh, the audio is not always totally clear, but you'll understand what's going on. Thank you. We Lolo on Hello today because we use it in routine to perform a really efficient uh, preoperative planning of the surgery and to know precisely what we have to do. Now we have also to add not only a nice image like this, but to add physical property. And it is clearly the key point of the future, be able to do, to add to this rendering, a patient specific physical property. You see here what we can obtain when you do that. You can add a simulation from a patient specific modeling where organs are moving in real time, thanks to this physical property. So from this data, we can now go in the OP room and try to superimpose the image onto the patient. Provide at distance such vision. Here you see an adrenal tumor 
that is resected and you see the superimposition performed from your CAD and sent back to the hospital see, we're, uh, we're in the OP room through fiber optics. You see here moving. that we don't see the vein. Thanks to this superimposition, you see the lower adrenal vein really efficiently. You can see also here the upper adrenal vein. So you see the, the great benefit you can have to superimpose because you will discover anatomical structure intraoperatively. So hopefully you understood everything that he said, but the bottom line is, is you actually saw in real time a computer assisted operation where in this particular case, he wanted to get to the adrenal vein, which is always, which is a little bit difficult in terms of that area because there are many other things, including fascia, fat and other things that include the ability to see it. He had none of those problems because he was looking at the adrenal vein superimposed on the patient herself. This ability to use real-time high-resolution graphics and specular lighting, superimposition and deformation are all based upon powerful GPU hardware from manufacturers who specialize in rendering game graphics. There are a host of other logical areas that benefit from this kind of AR overlay, some of which you've probably seen every day. Here is a logical approach that has a variety of pieces of information that have everything from hitting to speed and elevation on something called an ILS. You see that in the lower left, you see ILS1. So this is basically taking the vertex points of a cone going down to the runway. This is in the middle of the day, but it gives all of this useful information to the pilot. It's very important. But the exact same kind of information can be superimposed at night, where it makes the landing even more safe by virtue of the fact that all of this information is available to the pilot. And it doesn't care whether or not there are clouds out, it's day or night. The beauty of this is that the superimposition is giving the kind of feedback that the brain needs to see and interpret relative to successful landing. The same thing is being done today commercially with vehicle safety. And when we talk about things such as distancing, you've probably seen this on cars in which you've already driven, but look at this one. This is a little more difficult to understand, but let me tell you what it is. Do you see at the one or two o'clock position, the red difficult to see thing? That's actually a deer running perpendicular to the road ahead. The estimated time of travel of the vehicle shows the predicted impact point of the upcoming collision, giving the driver enough warning to slow down and avoid hitting the deer. Now, providing ubiquitous FLIR technology, forward-looking infrared technology for everyone, which used to be hugely expensive, but now with its ability to see through fire and smoke or building walls, while staying in constant voice contact and monitoring the rescuer's vital signs is also going to be a major safety boon because you don't need the FLIR itself if you have the capacity to, to mimic it. Whole different issue, but we can, we can talk about that a little later. But the bottom line is, is that you're taking these hugely expensive things and you're lowering the cost by utilizing the, the benefits of technology today. The offshoots of early VR and AR are spreading to other areas that use many game techniques and devices for entirely new purposes. <clears throat> Some of the uses are basic, such as augmented business cards and virtual real estate sales, but other uses for entertainment and like business purposes as well. People use them whichever way they think is going to be beneficial, interesting, and ultimately remunerative to themselves. But all of them are following the historic trajectory of disruptive technologies. Provide the tools, open the system, and allow creative chaos to flourish. Innovation flourishes this way. Let's talk about the Internet of Things for the moment. This is another technology influenced by games that will provide big data to track and measure almost anything electronic. Maps overlay in front of you, preferred routes and distances are calculated, lights, time, traffic avoided, infinite routes to shopping and restaurants and parks. You know, I already have some of this at home. 
Signs and roadways appear illuminated in bright sun or night, rain or fog, customized to your vision requirements. But there are other many logical applications as well. Some of them will be very beneficial. Some of them are a tiny bit concerning. Where high magnification cameras scan a thousand faces a second at 100 meters, while cross-referencing visa, criminal, and terrorist databases. The implications are enormous. Push forward a few technologic generations. Think of the social changes in a society where everything you see can be analyzed computationally. It is the embodiment of sociologist Pierre Levey's hive mind of which he wrote over 20 years ago in his book, Collective Intelligence. Around the world, the concept of intellectual property and privacy will be challenged by technologic assault. But for all the bumps, there may be some pearls in there as well, because similar to the end of the 19th century, where bank robbers counted on a lack of awareness by local law enforcement officials, the new West will usher in a time when physical violence is rapidly exposed and completely unprofitable. You know, your local societal misfit will have to have a PhD in computer science or find another trade. Society may well become more peaceful and honest if for no other reason than fear of instant identification to all appropriate public or private video screens, frozen assets, public transport denial, electronic account freezing, no more cash available to you. You don't think there's gonna be cash in the future, do you? and rapid capture. Next generation screens will be as flexible and thin as a sheet of paper. Embedded sensors will allow the screen to camouflage into the background, show your personal art preferences on your walls or morph into an entertainment display. AR overlays can provide augmented capabilities such as night vision, magnification, whatever you want, on your wrist, on your wall, on your computer, it doesn't matter. It's like a sheet of patient paper. As one step closer to universal translation, your glasses will also help facilitate translation of what you see. And online support, family or otherwise, using graphic overlays will help you perform repairs for those few connected devices unable to repair themselves. Imagine a two-dimensional screen that allows you to feel three-dimensional surface structure while manipulating virtual images. Disney has already demonstrated a technology that replicates tactile surface depth on flat screens. How do we know? They filed a patent. Now, while Oculus and others in the VR space still have important hurdles to overcome, there's nevertheless genuine potential in the arena of real-time immersive experience. Haptic feedback uses force to mimic various real-world effects. Taken to the next level, it has the potential to provide the tactile feelings that we expect within a hollow deck like experience of Star Trek fame. We're not there yet, but many are working very hard to make transmission of physical presence a reality. And while I won't take the time to show you the full video, look carefully at this and you'll see that that red ball is being physically manipulated by those mock hands on that flat plate, which responds to, again, connect controllers by that person researcher, this is at the MIT Media Lab, who's in another room, actually playing with the ball back and forth between their hands. As I said, this is, out, this is in the laboratories, coming out of the laboratories, soon to come to a space near you. So I wanna show you a quick video of something that's commercial. You can buy it today, and it takes something that used to cost over $100,000, and it brings it down to the cost of $1,000 or less. Now, while that's still not inexpensive, comparatively, it allows far more experimentation. This is called 
looking glass. And I want you to just think about the implications of it if you were a hobbyist. My name is Sean Frain. I'm a longtime holographer and one of the co-inventors of the looking glass. I've dreamed of having a holographic display most of my life. Not AR or VR, but, you know, a hologram. The looking glass is a new type of light field display that generates 45 simultaneous views of a 3D world, all at 60 frames per second. No VR headset required. Just go up to one of these displays and you look at it and you interact with it. There's no clunky headgear, there's no extended setup. It's amazing. We're releasing a Unity SDK and Universal Model and Animation Importer, with a lot more plugins into other 3D creation tools over the coming months. No matter what tool you use, your work will be able to come to life in the looking glass. So rather than do a commercial for looking glass, I just want to show you that so that you understand that this is actually happening. A lot of these trickle down effects are occurring right now. So we know that visual retention occurs basically as fast as we see changing scenes. And the result is reinforced memory, which equates to learning. This is yet another reason why this area holds such great potential in experiential education. We're all products of evolution and we're wired the way that nature decided was important for survival of our species. And as we couple our innate capacity to the power of computational media, imagination is unleashed and we're able to bridge the real with the virtual. The most remarkable part being that if we do it well, our brains do not perceive any difference between the two. Now, Arthur Clarke, the father of the communication satellite, once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, welcome to the magic show. So if you want to ask some questions, I'm here to answer them. Well, unfortunately, we've gone over time and uh, we had a lecture scheduled after this. We're very sorry to the audience that we aren't able to take up your questions. Very sorry, sir, but that was a wonderful lecture. Very insightful. Thank you. If you want to ask questions, feel free to write me, CS. Weaver, C.S. Weaver, at mit.edu. Yes, that would be really helpful if the audience can take note of that. We're very sorry again to the audience. We were, we really apologize for this technical error. Well, thank, thank you so much for being here, sir. Welcome. Take care. Thank you.